Good morning. Hello. Morning, everybody. Nice to see you. How are you keeping? Fairly well, well now, thank you. Very well. well. We're all missing each other, aren't we? <laughs> okay, yeah, give us a wave then. See you later. Hi, all. How are you? Good. Very well. What have you been doing all this time? What, do you wanna, what have you been doing? Baking cakes. Baking cakes. Baking cakes. Going, in, going, going in pool. Going on walks. Going on walks. Going in the swimming pool. In your garden, I just better say for everybody in the garden, that's watching. Not public swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> but you were just saying you're having a good time together. We are. Yeah? We're having a fun time. Because yeah. Bill's got the time off work to yeah. spend some time with you all. Do some DIY, catch up and that kind of stuff. Yeah. What? Doing oh, a yeah, we also <laughs> made a piggy bank. Yeah. Made piggy bank. Mm. Made piggy banks, clay, painted yeah. them. Haven't we? we Uno like... daily, don't we? <laughs> play a game of cards every day. To see who loses. <laughs> You're doing all right, aren't you? It's lovely yeah. to see everybody. Be pleased to see you. Thanks ever so much. See ya. Bye. Hi, Clive. It's lovely to see you. How are you Hi, doing? Yeah. yeah, very well, thank you. I'm like everybody else, getting a bit fed up with the uh, the lockdown, but um, at least things are easing a bit. So yeah, quite well, thank you. And what have you been doing? Um, quite a lot. I've been fairly fairly busy and just pottering around the garden. Um, been doing doing my exercises, my uh, ten thousand steps on. Fit bit and uh, yeah, looking after the flowers and the veggies. So eating my fresh vegetable produce since it's been very nice. You're going to uh, make us all jealous at this rate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I had a few vi visitors and been to see a few people. Like uh, coming to see you and Kath, and um, had my mum and sister up last weekend, which was lovely. And um, yeah, just spent about three or four hours with them, chatting and. Just not doing very much, but relaxing with them. But it's lovely to see them. Hi, all of you. How are you doing? Hi, Alison. Very well. Hello, everybody. Fine, thank you. Look at the camera. What have you been doing? We've been doing homework and going outside to ride our bikes. Oh, that sounds lovely. What about Mummy? Yeah, well, a lot of homeschooling. Back to work just two mornings a week now. Mummy can't even ride a bike. And lots of baking as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about you, Jade? What have you been doing? I'm going outside and having to and riding my bike. You've been and doing what? I've been in the paddling pool. Oh, lovely. Yeah, so, the weather's been fantastic, hasn't it? Yeah. Yes, very well. Yeah. Playing, yeah. And you're all well? Yes. Yeah, give, give thanks, yes. You know, touch wood. And we continue to pray well. because of the family situation yeah. in Jamaica. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Thanks, Alison. Hi, Damien here from church hope you're having a great lockdown right looking forward to being let free <laughs> back into into reality and hopefully for coffee okay. and they're not that church though whichever one <laughs> there you go. bye hi Alison lovely to see somebody uh, you know me I read I do crosswords watch telly I've even been known to do a bit of housework. Goodness me, eh? <laughs> Wednesday nights, a church quiz team all Zoom together. That's lovely. I enjoy the services. I haven't got a mention this week. I want to thank Val Richardson because I got this sort of craft work basket of flowers, which I phoned and thanked her for early on. All my friends from church, they all offer to help. I don't always need it, but the offers are always there. Which is fantastic, isn't it? That's right. And of course, Marion pops around from time to time with rhubarb and what else. It's nice rhubarb too. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look who I found. It's Hayley and Elizabeth. You're going to wave. Say hi. You have a wave, Elizabeth? Maybe later. Oh, smile? Yeah. Maybe. So how are you guys been? Have you been all right? Yeah, you've been yeah. Here. You're back at school teaching, aren't you? Yeah. 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 Where did Pepper go? I don't know. Maybe she's gone to find some muddy puddles to jump in, eh? There's a few around at the minute. <laughs> it's lovely to see you both and glad to see you're looking so well. Thank you very much. Thank you for popping out. I'll go away now. Leave you in peace for your dinner. <laughs> see you soon. Bye. Bye.
Well, good morning and welcome to our service. We are Potter Street Baptist Church in Harlow in the UK. And if you've stumbled across us for the first time on the internet and you're wondering where that is exactly, it's about 20 miles outside London to the north and slightly to the right. My name is Tim West and I'm trainee minister here, serving alongside Alison Taylor, our minister. This building behind me, our building, it dates back to 1756 and it's quite a landmark on the corner of Potter Street here, our local community. And the church itself was founded even earlier in 1662 to worship God in spirit and in truth. And the founders were so determined that nothing was going to stop them doing this, they met in secret in the woods, in some local woods at first. And here we are all these years later carrying on the tradition. Except it's not a tradition. Christianity for me is anything but a tradition. Jesus, when he came, turned everything upside down. He was no fan of tradition. The world as he saw it had gone badly off target. The way people were treating each other, even life itself, almost everything had fallen away from what it could have been. Now Jesus came to point the way back, I believe, towards the place where he came from. Another realm completely. But as he tried to show people that he was for real, often through completely impossible actions normally, like walking on water or turning water into wine, well, he proved a challenge too far for some, mostly the people in power. He taught people, he healed people. There are multiple accounts of this. He explained about the world he knew, that he, where he had come from, and he called it the kingdom. And he promised us that through him, that kingdom was somehow close by, at hand, he told us. And Jesus says to anyone who will listen, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. By joining with us this morning, you will be just the other side of that door which Jesus is knocking on. And I don't really care about tradition, about who started this church or why. As much as this building is loved by us and is familiar to us, it really is just a building. And it won't last forever and is unimportant in the great scheme of things. What's really important is that I know that Jesus is in my life now and that he wasn't before. I know he's alive, that all of the universe is his and that life does have a meaning and a purpose through him after all. That's why I'm a Christian and it's brilliant. And this morning I want you to hear from others why they are Christians too. So you're invited to join us this morning as we celebrate together what God has done in Jesus. He didn't leave us in ignorance but left a perfect place and arrived here where he knew he would meet struggle and hardship and ultimately death. God came as one of us to show those who would listen the way back to him. It's a completely free offer of grace and forgiveness of a new relationship with your God. Later on we'll share communion together so have some uh, bread and some wine handy as we uh, remember Jesus' death and resurrection. So let's take a moment for prayer and reflection and then we can sing our first song together. Father God, as we start our time together this morning, we want to give you thanks and praise for that free offer of coming into your presence, no matter where we are, Lord. We welcome your Holy Spirit into our homes as we sit on our sofas or gather around our tablets, Lord. We welcome you our risen Lord. Praise your name, Father God. Help us for the power of your Holy Spirit. Worship and praise you, just as been done here for centuries, in spirit and in truth. Amen. Let's sing. Oh, 
Father, we want to acknowledge the good things you give us in our lives. Family, friends, possessions, time, money, food, we know it all comes from you, Lord. We thank you for our faith in you, perhaps the most precious thing to us, faith that you love us and take us as we are, faith that we are your children faith that we're your family, Lord. Everything is made by you, God, even time itself. Yet we do get carried away and call it ours. Show us a better way, Father. Show us that this doesn't mean as much as we think it does. You warned us not to store up treasure. You explained that your kingdom, your heart, is something of far greater value, and we should seek after that. Though we don't have the opportunity to give directly to your work, Lord, at the moment, keep us giving cheerfully in other ways. You love a cheerful giver. You want our hearts right in this matter, God. Show us what a generous spirit is, God. Thank you for gifts that the church receives at this time. Money, clothing, food, even just time given to be with others. All these things are from you, God. And we ask that you take them and multiply them as only you can for your work, your kingdom, your love with us, your children, in this place. Amen. Janet, you've, you've got in touch with me and you've, uh, you've texted your testimony, but I'm going to, I wanted you to come on Zoom and I wanted to ask you a little bit more. Tell us why. You're a Christian. Well, it, it might, might, it, I didn't become a Christian sort of overnight. It, mm. it was a gradual thing. My, my brother, as I said to you, introduced me to the church um, through Arnold Saul, who was the minister at the time. And for, for a long time, people were talking in tongues and things, and I thought I'd got to have this miraculous 
thing to tell me I was a Christian. But then I realised in time that I love the Lord and that was all that really, I didn't have to have a vision or a, you know, it was just a very gradual thing. So uh, uh, over time, you, you felt God's presence in your life. Is that... Well, I always felt that God was there, but I, everybody was saying that they had these sort of visions and um, all singing, all dancing things happen, but that didn't happen to me, which made me think, you know, uh, I knew I loved the Lord, but I thought I'd got to have some real miraculous thing happen. And, and that didn't happen as as it was doing to other people, but still no. God took you on. I think, is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And yeah. became, yeah. So so today, Janet, what, what does he mean to you in your life today? Because we're, we're some distance down the road, aren't we? Yes, yes. Well, I think it, he's, it, he's a constant, you know, he's always been there for me in bad times and in good times. Yes, he's always been there. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. It's 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 really good to hear uh, that aspect of your faith. Uh, thank you so much because I know you wouldn't normally, maybe, be one to speak up uh, in church, perhaps about things. But really, do appreciate you coming on and sharing your faith with us in this way. It's been fantastic. Well, what 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 prompted me really was that my brother sent me this link yesterday of. Um, of a video that, that he put, he, he liked a song, he liked this song and he put the, he does all the artwork for it. So he, he, and he sent it to me as a link to watch. And he said he was showing it in his church. Yeah. And I, I said to him, oh, perhaps this is something I could send to my church and they could, they could show it. And then I thought, well, I need to say, you know, what my brother means to me. And it was my brother that brought me into Potter Street Baptist Church. Yeah. So he was he, he was there at the beginning of your journey yes, of faith. and he was. God used, yes. God used him, yeah. 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 Which is another brilliant aspect of the story. Um, yeah. And, and you sent me the link. I've listened to the song. So it's a lovely song. Um, we can't include it in the service because I think that will be kind of copyright issues. But we will send around the link so people can right. hear that song that yeah. he's, yes. he's done. Yeah. This is this is my baptism sheet. Could you hold that up to the camera for us a little bit closer? And look at that. Yeah. And the date down the bottom there? Well, it, it says I was baptised on April the 27th, 1969. You right. probably weren't even born then. Um, and then yeah. um, it says I became a member of the church in May 1969. Fantastic. Uh, Janet, thank you so much indeed for your for your time and for, for, for coming on camera as well.
Hello everyone. I asked Tim if he wanted a moment this week and he said he did. I said anything specific and he said yes. Why are you a Christian in 60 seconds? It's a good question and you should try it yourself. But I would say some days it's easier to answer than others. But today, 60 seconds. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died and rose again. I believe he's a living, loving God. I believe he's here now, with us all. The commonality I feel when I'm worshipping with other believers is unmistakable. Historically, I've tried not to believe and life didn't work. The word believe can mean to have faith in, to trust or to know to be true. Who needs 60 seconds, Tim? Have a good week. Thank you for asking me the question, uh, why I'm a Christian. To be quite honest with you, um, I've had remarkable and incredible personal testimonies that are miracles that have really convinced me beyond doubt that everything I see in the Bible, I read in the Bible, they are real and true because God, by His grace, it's not that God has to convince me but God by his grace and mercy has actually allowed me to have such encounters that made me to know without any shadow of doubt that all these things are real so God's word is real God is real and I don't think I'm going to be anything else apart from being a Christian in fact it is actually amazing if you look at what I have here it's one of my incredible miracles when I found it difficult to to open a bank account then I was quite new in the United Kingdom over, over 50, about 15 years ago it was um, a dream that God gave me and showed me someone opening an account with this that made me to actually go into the bank and the bank was able to open an account with me uh, with a P60 but without that dream I never knew I could open my account with P60 and uh, I'm, 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 I'm totally convinced Jesus Christ is alive and lives forevermore. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Stay blessed. Amen.
stillness and quiet that I am the Lord let go let go of your worries only one thing is needed be still and still and no that I am the Lord be still be still and know that in stillness and quiet that I am the Lord Loving Heavenly Father despite everything that's going on around the world today we still stand in awe at the beauty of your amazing creation and give thanks that we are part of it while we have so many good things to enjoy that make our life better, some of man's developments in the modern world are having disastrous side effects on your plan. We ask you to show mercy and compassion so that the universe can recover and flourish as you intended it to be. We ask that the power of the Holy Spirit will turn around the hearts and minds of those responsible for injustice and hardship experienced by so many. We pray for a fair distribution of the world's resources so that innocent people do not die of hunger and avoidable disease. We pray for all the areas of the world where the virus is causing so many thousands of deaths. We pray for healing for those in recovery or who are dealing with ongoing disabilities as a result of the coronavirus. Along with many others, we are praying for effective treatments, vaccines and other preventative measures that will bring this infection under control. We pray that countries will work together and share information for the overall benefit of everyone and that companies will care more about saving lives than financial gain. We give thanks for all care workers everywhere, especially our doctors and nurses in the front line. We pray for their safety and for that of their loved ones. We ask you to uphold all those dealing with bereavement, particularly if due to the virus. For those with faith, may they feel your love and strength. For those who have not met you, speak to them in their time of sorrow. We pray for everyone connected with PSBC, from the youngest to the oldest, all who are missing our weekly meetings and activities. We give thanks that so many are able to keep in touch by post or telephone or new technology like our services on CDs and Zoom meetings and YouTube and for the doorstep flying visits to say hello. We think of staff and pupils in schools as more children are returning. We pray for their physical and mental well-being we ask you to be in all the decisions being made throughout the education sector and that there will not be unmanageable repercussions in the future. We pray that people around the world will be careful not to behave in ways that will spread the virus, to be mindful of others and for patience and tolerance. We give thanks for answered prayer. We continue in hope as we lift to you all those known to us personally who are undergoing various treatments, recovering from surgery, struggling with severe pain and those waiting for surgery that has been delayed by the impact of the virus. We pray for your protection, dear Lord, on Alison and Tim as they lead us during this challenging time and give thanks for the many ways in which you are speaking through them. We give thanks for all those who are able to reach out with little acts of kindness, which means so much to so many people. And finally, we ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, so why am I a Christian? Um, well, I had an encounter with God when I was a young person, and even though uh, it seems a long time ago, I still encounter God. It's not a once in a lifetime opportunity, it's almost a daily looking for him, searching for him and finding him. Um, God has sustained me throughout my life um, in the really good times and the really rubbish times, um, such as when I had a hysterectomy, um, when my husband said he didn't love me anymore, and more recently through the horrendous experience that was the menopause. And I just think my relationship with Jesus, it, it just makes sense to me. It makes sense in a thinking sort of way. It makes sense in a feeling sort of way. And actually, I can't imagine my life without Jesus. Well, I've come inside now because it looks like rain outside. And also, I never ever get the chance to have the pick of all the seats in the church. So I've chosen a comfy one and I've made myself comfortable with my cushion here. So we're going to turn to God's Word now, John's Gospel, chapter 7, and Jean is going to read for us verse 25 uh, to 52. We'll take it, I think, in three sections. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him, but no one held a hand against him because his hour had not yet come. Still, many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? Have you ever been amongst a crowd, perhaps, that has been getting gradually more and more restless, where there's tension building for whatever reason? The closest I've come to that, I think, is in London on the Tube, where the platform gets more and more crowded because there's a delay to trains and people are starting to wonder uh, what is going on and they don't feel safe. It's not pleasant. We've seen it in London recently, haven't we? With crowds, things can quickly get out of hand. Um, people have attended protests just because they want to have their say, but they come away injured, children with their families even. Police officers on duty have been hurt as well. Jesus is at the temple here, and we have exactly that sort of rising tension. He's just broken the law, so the authorities are upset with him. So he's arrived at this large festival in secret, but now he's there speaking openly about God again. And that's quite subversive behaviour when you think about it. Those in charge are out for him, and they're looking for reasons to arrest him, and they're closing in. As far as they're concerned, Jesus is a troublemaker and a lawbreaker. And John wants us to feel the mood of the crowd here at this point. He wants to jostle us with his writing as if we're there. So he gives us something of what people are saying. Isn't this Jesus, the one that they're after? Why are they just letting him speak? Maybe even they think he's the Messiah now. No, hang on a minute. He can't be the Messiah. We know where he's from. The scrolls say that no one will know where the real Messiah comes from. So back and forth, the conversation was going, who is this man? There's a reason why John has put it like this, because John knows who he is. 
He's lived and he's breathed with Jesus. He was there with Jesus until the end. And he wants you and me in that crowd, being challenged, being pulled into the arguments. Who is this man? Who is he really? Is he just a hot shot from down the road? But then how can he have fed all those people? He can't be the son of God. It's just impossible. All those loony followers of his, they're all bonkers. But yet, he does seem to talk a lot of sense. And he cares about people. So where does his wisdom come from? Oh, I don't know. Well, I remember that conversation going on in my head as I first became a Christian many years ago. And the questions seemed to get louder and louder. Who was Jesus? Was he God, the cause of everything we see around us, the reason we're here? Or was it all a grand trick? Honestly, I thought I was going to go mad with it all, trying to work it all out. I listened to people, I read, I argued back, I argued with Christians, and uh, I argued with atheists, I argued with Muslims, I even argued with my own mum. Sorry mum. And eventually I realised I was never going to definitively, scientifically get to the bottom of it. And to be honest, I was becoming a little bit tortured by the question, is there a God? I realised then that I had nothing to lose. That if there was no God, then life was pretty absurd, really. So in 1988, I prayed out to God, quite exasperated, oh, if you're there, show me. But back to our crowd for a moment, the ones in charge, the rulers of the Pharisees, they're getting very upset. And Jean is going to take our reading on for us. The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? Now it seems to me here that Jesus is almost stirring it. Maybe he thinks he has nothing to lose at this stage. He may have arrived in secret, but now he's shouting out his mission. People would have really struggled at the time to understand exactly what he was saying. What does he mean we won't find him? As he wrote this passage, John realises that Jesus is talking prophetically about his death, resurrection and return to God's realm. And today we can all see that that is attested to, just as Jesus said it would. If anything, we have less excuse to ignore Jesus here, less excuse to walk away, because we can see that what he said came true. And the question this puts in front of us, where do we stand in this crowd, is really difficult to ignore. And you can be certain, Jesus does not want to be ignored. That is the last thing he wants. Even if it kills him, and it will, He's going to be heard. It's nearly the end of the festival. And every day, as a ritual, priests have been symbolically pouring water, gathered from a local spring, onto an altar at the front of the temple. It happens each day in the morning. And it's a way of reminding people to be thankful for, for the water and to represent the life that water brings to their crops. And it's also the late dry season, um, sorry, late, late autumn, the dry season, and, and water is pretty scarce anyway, and that probably just gives it all that extra meaning. 
But on the last day, they stop the water pouring and they just have a solemn assembly. So Jesus makes his move. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Well, Jesus has indeed got nothing to lose. It's all or nothing now for him as he stands up and he says to a hot, thirsty crowd, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Rivers of living water will flow. And he makes this stunning offer in a loud voice to anyone who will hear it. Anyone. The people who have been debating him, agreeing with him, the people who have been disagreeing with him or cursing him, even the people who have come to arrest him. And that is one of the most amazing things about Jesus, if you ask me, that he can look across a crowd of anyone and everyone and make them all the same offer. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've said, if you come to me, I will not turn you away. And the idea of flowing rivers of living water would have struck a, a chord with Jews over and above the water pouring in the festival. They would have perhaps connected it with Moses in uh, Numbers chapter 20, when Moses struck the rock and, and water poured out. And gospel readers coming to Jesus' death, the story of Jesus' death later, might think of that offer that he made when a spear was st struck into Jesus' side and blood and water flowed out. The final part of the text, honestly, it's like something out of a pantomime. The guards sent to remove Jesus from the temple and shut him up report back empty-handed. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, does this law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, are you from Galilee? Look into it and you will find that a, a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So the rulers were not happy. Interestingly, John puts them distant from the situation. Report back, he says. They're not actually there listening to Jesus, but they are making judgments on him. They'd sent in their henchmen, and the henchmen had to explain, had to explain why they'd come back empty-handed. Well, boss, this Jesus, he really, he really was speaking quite a lot of sense. Of course, the bosses were not happy. They had a lot to lose, as Jesus seemed to be eroding their whole power base, saying he knew God. 
that God was offering a new start. Jesus claimed it was possible to have an intimacy with God that had never been thought about before. And to be quite frank, they couldn't touch that offer and it probably threatened them. And it is true, isn't it, that the more you've got to lose in life, the less likely you are to hear the voice of God calling you. He may ask you to give up whatever it is you're clinging on to, power in this case, but with us today it might be status, money, or, or something perhaps deep down that we know isn't doing us any good. But we can't imagine living without it. We've got too much to lose, so I'll go my own way. But if any of us find ourselves in that dilemma, and I know from personal experience how hard it is to give up sometimes, think about that offer from Jesus in the temple that day. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. What God offers you is infinitely more valuable than whatever it is you feel you can't do without. So predictably, the Pharisees in charge denounce the guards and say they must have been taken in. And I remember I had exactly the same reaction with some people all those years ago as I thought about Jesus' words for myself for the first time. You're being deceived, I was told, as I was becoming a Christian. But I prayed that prayer anyway, figuring that I had nothing to lose. If nothing happened, maybe I'd look a bit foolish, but at least I'd know either way whether there was a God or not. But nothing did not happen. In fact, the opposite of nothing happened. A little while after, I felt waves of love come over me, such a powerful feeling of being loved and valued. I had never felt anything like it eclipsing any human love. I felt free, free from things that I knew I had done wrong in my life and, and times that I had messed up. God's Holy Spirit, those rivers of living water that Jesus promised, came to me. It was transformative. I began to have real relationships with people, honesty, upfrontness, no more pretending, or at least not as much. I seemed to know suddenly why I was alive, because I'd been made by this amazing, incredible, loving intelligence that before then I had only ever imagined could have existed. Several times since, God has reminded me spiritually, emotionally, that he is here with me. And it has always been, whenever I've been brought to that place, where I've given up false riches and value that I thought I had and simply done what Jesus offered, gone to him. And I've come to realise that compared to what God can give you, you really have nothing to lose of any value from this world. So come, come to Jesus, anyone, everyone, and he will give you a drink as you have never experienced it before. Amen.
Well, we've heard today about the crowd in the temple and about how Jesus took the risks he did. And he made that offer to everyone in a loud voice that if they would only go to him, he would let them drink, which would cause something wonderful to happen in their lives. And he used those images of rivers and water flowing to describe the new life that he wanted to give. And Jesus made several similar offers while he was here, and each of them was connected directly to accepting him. There was nothing else that seemed to matter to him. He wanted people to return to him, to turn away from a life without God, to turn away from old and broken ways, to turn back to him. But he knew that to make good on that offer of his, a price would have to be paid. And God was never going to sweep sin under the carpet because it just doesn't work like that. And we wouldn't want it to, would we? Real forgiveness that works is also going to cost. And he knew he was the only one that could bring about that forgiveness. He knew he was the answer himself to the problem of broken relationships between humankind and God. So he went willingly and obediently to his death. He allowed himself to be captured and killed. Apart from anything else, like the extreme trauma, the pain and the separation, it was a demonstration of his faith in his, in his father that he would ultimately be reunited with him as he was raised to life again. And he did this for us in the face of all the hatred he experienced Paul points out just what an incredible demonstration of God's love this all was, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. And Jesus himself invites us to share in his death and resurrection. He knew full well what was going to happen on the night before they arrested him. At his last meal with the disciples, he symbolically held out bread and wine to represent for all time his body that would be broken and his blood that would be shed. And in a moment, we'll eat the bread and drink the wine together, but it's only right that we do two things before this. First, we should give thanks to God for Jesus and the sacrifice he made. And despite appearances, Jesus didn't have to die for us. Nobody forced him. He could have brought down a thousand angels to rescue him, but he stayed up there on the cross for you and me. So, Alison, would you like to pray? Thanks for Jesus. Lord, we are amazed that your love would reach down to save us. We continue to thank you for Jesus who died for us, for our sin. He carried our guilt that you might accept us into your holy presence. In this place today, we confess him again as our saviour and we commit ourselves to you. Thank you for this bread and for Christ's presence among us. Join us as one body through his body. Help us to be thankful always for the only reason we can come before you today is your son, Jesus Christ. He alone can remove the sin that separates us from you. We thank you that he cleansed us by his blood making us at peace with you and enabled us to speak with you. Remind us once more through the bread and the wine that we share of all you have done, of all you have given, and in return, help us to give our all to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alison. Well, secondly, we should remember why he did it and that it was our sin that he was carrying. Okay, please spend a moment in quiet, just confessing and bringing before God anything that you know you need to in your heart. And don't think there is anything that can stop God from coming towards you now from forgiving you, for forgiving you. Because Jesus spoke in a loud voice to the whole crowd. That's everyone, you and me. So let's pause.
On the night he was betrayed, Jesus lifted the bread from the table and he held it in front of his disciples. Um, and he said it represented his body, which was about to be broken. After giving thanks to his father, he tore it and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Whenever you do this, think of me. So together we eat the bread. And after they'd eaten the bread, in the same way, he took the cup of wine and he held this up as well. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim Jesus' death until he returns. We drink together. Living God, you called us to remember and give thanks. Today we do that separately, but in unity as your disciples. We live in the light of your presence, though we realise many do not. We've tasted the bread of heaven and shared the new wine of your kingdom, but many have not. We ask now that you empower us by your spirit, that we may go with your gospel of peace, spreading out your good news for all who are around us to hear, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we're aware as Christians that this is not the end of it. We'll be here again, needing to remind ourselves of the sacrifice that Jesus has made. And surely we'll need to ask for forgiveness again and again, of course. But as we go, let us remember we do not go alone. Jesus, after he was risen, explained he would go shortly to be with God, but would send his Holy Spirit. I felt it, you felt it. And so accompanied by the Holy Spirit and with the full armour of God, we will tell of the incredible love that we now know of coming from a father so good we can barely imagine it.
I think just for your information, it's worth us saying that you know, as well as I do, that we have the opportunity to open our church buildings. For us, this would be an absolute logistical nightmare. We will meet to discuss it and we will take on board further government guidelines, but at the moment, there are no plans to open our building to meet together to worship at 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. We will continue to do that virtually um, for the time being. If I say I'm considering September, but just one day at a time, thank you for your patience. Thank you for everything that you're doing. I give thanks for the people that you are. Thank you, Alison. So let's end our service today with the grace. Let's say the grace together. The, the grace, grace of, of our, our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and the, the love, love of God, God and, and the, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be, be with, us with us all evermore. evermore. Amen. Are you going to have a song? Um, where, where, bit, so after just, this or end of No, this. I think that it should be so good we can barely imagine it. Then have a song.